evening, uh, everyone. Welcome uh, to this session on um, what's the topic again? <laughs> the systematic coaching, facilitating the conversation. So I would like to welcome each and every one of you, uh, Elizabeth, uh, Chuck, you, Lily, Guaching, and Roy. Uh, Roy uh, from uh, Manila. Uh, from Manila, right? Uh, the Philippines. So thank you uh, for joining us. It is a pleasure for me to be meeting with you. Uh, and Chuxi has got another three kilometers to go. So go ahead, uh, Chuxi. <laughs> <All the best. laughs> and uh, Elizabeth, uh, drive safe. I hope you'll arrive uh, safely at home as you're driving and listening to this session. It is, to me, it is an honor and that you are, all of you are taking the initiative um, uh, to be here and it gives uh, you you give me great encouragement uh, to do the best that i can uh, in the session that we have uh, this evening now allow me to just uh, share screen uh, because i've uh, prepared some uh, slides for you yes uh, now this session that we have is part of our monthly uh, session on the meta coaching system. Uh, uh, we also have series on neurosemantics, self leadership, and uh, parenting. I uh, previously, over the last, what I can remember, more than two years, I've been doing the sessions every Thursday um, evening. Uh, it's just that uh, most recently, uh, the Institute of Neurosemantics uh, Malaysia, we started to have the Meta Cafe on the third Saturday of the month. So what I've done is that uh, uh, we schedule it for the third Saturday on the third week. So there are no uh, sessions on the third Thursday. So the first Thursday of the month, uh, it's on Neurosemantics. The second Thursday, it's on uh, Leadership or parenting. So I will be switching uh, the, the topics in that way. Uh, on the third week, it, it is on Saturday where we have our uh, Meta Cafe. And the fourth week of the month, uh, we have this session on the Meta Coaching System series. So I would like to bid everyone uh, welcome, uh, those of you who are here for the first time and also who are regulars, uh, thank you uh, for joining uh, us this evening. It is uh, truly an honor and pleasure for me. Allow me to introduce myself. I'm Mazuki. I'm a neurosemantics trainer and meta coach, and I represent Malaysia in the leadership team of the International Society of Neurosemantics. I help people to systematically develop skills in leading, communicating, and coaching to bring out the best in themselves and others. This session is scheduled for 60 to 90 minutes. So for this evening, uh, I'll be covering four main topics. One is coaching is a not normal conversation. The second uh, point is coaching, an extremely challenging conversation. The third point is kinds of coaching conversations. And the last point is on the NLP communication model for the coaching conversations. As usual, I will pause for discussion after each main point. This is to invite questions or comments uh, uh, and any contributions from you, you are most welcome uh, during the uh, short uh, pauses. And especially for those who are uh, who like to think out loud. Uh, let us also enjoy what it is that you are thinking about. My style is to be light and humorous. So if I laugh or smile, I'm never laughing at you, but at our silly human qualities. My purpose is to lighten things up, reduce being too serious and be more real. As we say in neurosemantics, if you get serious, you get stupid. So, <laughs> so that's also part of the reason that I would like to bring in uh, humor and I welcome humor from each and every one of you. And as what I have mentioned as part of the introduction uh, to this session uh, in uh, 
in the post. Uh, if coaching is anything, coaching is a conversation. It is a conversation like no other conversation. That's because coaching conversation is not a normal conversation. It is a unique, not so normal conversation in several ways. It is intense, personal, highly focused, one way, and sometimes a fierce conversation because it seeks to get to the heart of things, which requires challenge and confrontation. The coaching conversation is quintessentially to what a coach does. While it may seem easy, after all, you can say that it is just talking, isn't it? However, it is not. Nor is it just talking. Most people who first attempt it find that it is a hundred times more challenging than they ever imagined. What accounts for this? What is the challenge in facilitating a powerful coaching conversation? So let's get into the first point for this evening. And this first point is called coaching is a not normal conversation okay coaching is a not no, not normal conversation at the heart of coaching is conversing that's why dialogue lies at the very nature of coaching what happens in the coaching room is a dialogue between coach and client but and this is a critically important but, it is not a normal conversation. It is very unique and special conversation. It is a conversation like none other. Among the several factors which make the coaching conversation different and not normal are firstly, first, the conversation is one-sided. Normal conversations are two-sided. You talk about your views and opinions, and then I share my views and opinions, and it goes on uh, like that. You tell your story, and that reminds me of something similar and prompts me to share my own experience. But in coaching, the conversation is one-sided. It is all about the client. The sharing does not go back and forth. The focus stays exclusively on the client. What the client wants, thinks, believes, feels, and so on. And for some, this intense focus on the client feels uncomfortable, especially at first. It spotlights the client in a way that makes the conversation very different kind of conversation. So that's the first one. The conversation is one-sided. The second one is that the conversation is intensely intimate. Normal conversations stay pretty much on the surface. They are typically shallow. People talk about the weather, the favorite sports team, the aches and the pains that they have in their body. Only occasionally do they drop down into some personal and intimate areas. Yet, in coaching conversations, this is precisely where the conversation lives, at some of the deepest aspects of the client's experience. That makes the conversation direct, fierce, confrontational, and intimate. The third one is that the conversation goes for self-reflexive thoughts and feelings. It goes for the self-reflexive thoughts and feelings of the client. These deeper or higher thoughts are mostly out of conscious awareness. In meta-coaching, we call them the person's 
in a matrix of frames and meaning. Normal conversations typically deal with the first level and maybe second level thoughts. Coaching uh -huh. conversations go much deeper or higher to the thoughts behind the thoughts, to the feelings behind the feelings, to the meanings, for example, the assumptions and hidden, uh, hidden beliefs from which the person is operating as the person's map or model of the world. We also go to the kind of thinking by which the person creates his or her experience. We ask what the person is assuming for her to reach the conclusions that she has. So that's the third one. The conversation goes for self-reflexive thoughts and feelings. The fourth one is the conversation is challenging and even confrontational. Because the purpose of the coach is to stretch the person beyond his or her current experience. By its very nature, coaching is challenging. It invites the person into a more intimate and intense self-awareness. It does this by mirroring to the person the responses that one might want to refine and or develop. The coach will bring up things that could potentially be upsetting and holding the person's feet to the fire of inquiry. None of those are comfortable. In fact, coaching is by its very nature is designed to be uncomfortable. To invite the client to step out from his comfort zone and venture forward. For many coaches, it takes a while to get comfortable with being uncomfortable and intentionally inducing discomfort. Yet, this is essential for challenging a client to stretch out of his comfort zone. All of this explains why the coaching conversation is like none other. It is definitely not a normal conversation and therefore, unlike the conversations we have at the dinner table or at the mama shop, <laughs> restaurant, uh, we have, uh, uh, so all of those conversations we have uh, in social context, it is totally different from those. So those are four things with respect to coaching uh, conversations. Why we say that coaching is a, not normal conversation because firstly it is one-sided secondly uh, the conversation is intensely intimate the third one is that the conversation goes for self-reflexive thoughts and feelings and fourth the conversation is challenging and even confrontational so i'm going to pause here and invite uh, each and every one of you if you have any questions or any uh, any uh, ideas that come up, you are most welcome. Before before that, I'd just like to welcome uh, those who have just joined us. Uh, Tessie, uh, thank you for joining us. And also Chantel, uh, thank you for joining us. Go ahead, Lily. Uh, on the uh, number four points, right? Uh, the conversation is challenging and confrontation. Uh, for me, I just wanted to share my personal experience. When I first time being coach, I actually feel really, really very uncomfortable because I don't really understand at that time, I don't really understand what coaching is about. I just wonder why the coach keep asking me questions. <laughs> <laughs> because I find that I need help and, and I hope you can help me, but he keep asking me questions which I don't feel comfortable at all. So for this, right, uh, uh, what is your advice to overcome? I'm sure that other coaches will have same feeling like what I'm feeling. Yes. So uh, how, what, what is the approach or better way to make them feel comfortable on this 
<laughs> okay, so it is not our job as a coach to make them feel comfortable. <laughs> Because the thing about it is this, we want them to stretch, go beyond the comfort zone, and that is uncomfortable. So to, to a large extent, it is our job to get them to get out of their comfort. How we as a coach can help is to frame them up front. Before we begin the conversation or at the beginning of the first session, we tell them what uh, a coaching conversation is that uh, it is designed to stretch them out away from their comfort zone. And we tell them that there will be times that they'll feel really uncomfortable. However, we want to encourage them to stay with it and go through it because that is where the development comes in. So uh, having that frame up front, however, um, uh, do not make this uh, the mistake that uh, I made when I was first learning about coaching. I made the mistake of trying to be pleasant and uh, make it comfortable for the <laughs> for the client that i didn't ask the uh, the question that would have got them to make the decision uh, we were having a conversation and my client uh, was saying that she wanted to uh, quit smoking and uh, i asked her so when is it uh, when do you uh, when do you plan to stop smoking uh, we were in uh, in grand, Jun grand junction colorado at that time so she was from switzerland and she said that oh when i get back to switzerland i'm going to stop smoking and uh, trying to trying to be nice to her. Okay, so when you go back to Switzerland, <laughs> after that, my coach came to me and said, Mazuki, at that point, why did you not ask her what's stopping you from quitting smoking now? And I went, <gasps> <laughs> yeah, you, you would have not been comfortable for her, but that what would have been the uh, defining question for her. Yeah, I hope Ooh. that helps, Lily. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Because thank you. I, I really, I was wondering, and uh, at last, I kind of refused to meet him. <laughs> because, because I might, oh, why are you asking me this question that I don't feel good at all, you see? <laughs> but throughout the learning that I know, but I, I feel like sometimes having talent when, when do the coaching, and, and I find that uh, my coachee or the, uh, because I, I don't really work, I just do community uh, helping and then I find that the coaching feel like uh, why why you know just like what I said uh, the last time. So, Thank you very much. Yeah. So what you can do to help is to frame them that the conversation is going to be uncom uncomfortable because it is designed to push them uh, to uh, to uh, to be greater in order to achieve what they want. Yeah. So Roy, uh, go ahead. You are still muted, Roy. Yeah, there you go. Uh, yes, you mentioned about the uh, setting a frame at the beginning so that the, the person would know that you are going to coach them. Uh, very interesting because uh, I wanna I wanna say that because in my uh, organization, sometimes when I try to uh, give some uh, uh, sort of coaching, of course it's not mentoring, but I I really try to be silent. Uh, and, and really understand the other person's point of view and the questions that I ask. Uh, but sometimes if they don't know that I'm trying to coach them because I don't tell them at the beginning that I'm, you know what, we will have a coaching session today. Um, what is your advice on that? Uh, if I talk to my team, uh, to my uh, subordinates and wanting to, to coach them, I just feel awkward that if I tell them that, oh, I'm going to coach you today. Rather, mm -hmm. I, I want to go through that usual, well, not typical conversation, but the, the ones that you mentioned that I have to be intensely, it has to be intensely intimate. Uh, it has to be self-reflexive. I, I try as much as I can to follow that. But uh, sometimes uh, it gets to a point where I ask challenging questions uh, similar to what Lily asked, and and uh, gets the person uncomfortable. Mm. Uh, but if I don't tell them that I'm coaching them, they might think that my type of questioning is offensive rather than 
giving them a way to improve themselves. So, um, is there is it really necessary to say at the beginning that I'm gonna coach you? Uh, uh, how does that really change the the mindset of the person of the coachee? Uh, in your experience. Uh, thank you, Ryan. This is a, a very um, uh, practical uh, question that you are asking uh, there. Uh, uh, the first thing that I want to mention is that you don't coach uh, people who are not ready to be coached. Okay. Yeah. So if you want to coach um, uh, the people on your team, then they need to be aware that they are being coached. And you, you don't need to get them together and, uh, and begin the session, okay, this is a uh, coaching session, because the coaching moments can come, you know, you, 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 you are having a, a conversation at the water cooler, and then you may detect, hey, this is a coaching uh, moment with this person. So you want to engage the person in that conversation. So one way that you could do it is that you could just bring that to that person's attention. I noticed that this is something that bothers you. Would it be okay for you that I put on my coach's hat for the, for the moment? So now you're setting the frame. What you're, you're coming to him or her now is as the coach. So let the person... Uh, uh, um, be aware of that. Uh, yeah, it, because sometimes, uh, because coaching conversation is intense. Yeah, sometimes people they just want to uh, want to uh, want to hear advice. Uh, as a coach, we don't give advice. However, yes. if you are uh, that person superior, sometimes they just want to hear advice. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. That's true. So, so that person might say, uh, might say. Okay, I'm not ready to be coached right now, but I'm willing for. Uh, I, uh, if you can mentor me on this one, I'm happy to do that. So now you are putting on the mentor hat. So uh, if you are aware, we have the the different hats that you can wear, especially with your team members. You can wear the trainer hat. You can wear the consultant hat. You can wear mm -hmm. the mentor hat, or you can wear the coach's hat. Yeah. However, when you have that frame then the conversation will become uh, much more uh, impactful. Otherwise, as uh, what uh, Lily mentions, uh, they are not aware that you have stepped into the coaching uh, uh, role uh, suddenly <laughs> at, the, at the receiving end of, the, of this barrage of questions. They freak out. <laughs> they freak out. Yeah. That's true. That's true. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> that's me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, yes. so even like for example like the, the person asks you because normally they, they, they will come for a, an answer kind of thing they, they hope to you give them an answer or instruction or this kind of thing but when it come to coaching right can because I normally what I normally do is uh, I will tell them of course I don't have an answer but huh, if I am in that situation huh, I will do like this like this like this am I doing the right thing or not uh, uh, know that when you are doing that, you are uh, operating as a mentor. I see. And that's okay. Okay. Huh? Okay. Mm. Thank you. So this is where you just want to have that, that clarity. What, what, which hat are you uh, wearing now? So be ready. Your, your hands uh, should be able to hold at least four hats. You need to juggle <laughs> which one to wear. <laughs> Okay, right. Welcome, Diana. I noticed that you have just joined us. Thank you for joining us. And in the chat box, uh, Guat Ching put in there, just sharing my thoughts. I usually will tell my subordinate, that's the reason why I'm asking you those questions. I'm triggering your thinking process so you will be able to seek for the answer. They understand it and they appreciate it, yes. So those are what we call frames. We set the frame so that now uh, they are ready to receive the questions. Yeah. Thank you, Guaqing, uh, for that. Right. So let's move on to the next point. And the next point is coaching and extremely challenging conversation. 
the shocking thing, at least for, um, I would say, a great many people who attempt to coach is that coaching, the coaching process itself can be an extremely challenging experience to themselves as the coach. They had heard or knew that it would be challenging to the clients. They understood that. What they had not anticipated was how it can be challenged. It can be a challenge to the coach. It can challenge the coach who conducts the coaching conversations. What explains this? What is the challenge in the conversation to coaching? So let's take a look. The first one is the challenge of really listening. To actively listen in a way that enters into the client's phenomenal world, deep enough to understand uh, the client on the client's terms and to express such to the client's satisfaction and delight. It's challenging. Most people have to go through lots and lots and lots of training and practice and supervision to be able to do that. But why? Why is listening so challenging? Primarily, the coach has to break her old habits of passive listening or defensive listening or listening through a preferred filter. The filter could be therapy or problem solving or consulting or debating. So if you're operating from those filters, then you need to stop doing that. Then the coach has to get out of the mode of instrumental listening. Instrumental listening refers to where the coach listens for some specific purpose to do something, to be successful as a coach, to solve the client's problem. So that's what we call instrumental listening. In meta coaching, we speak about non-instrumental listening as sacred listening. Listening for no purpose. Listening to simply be with the person. Listening to the client on the client's own terms requires this sacred listening. Listening without judgment. Listening with acceptance and appreciation. And listening simply to be present to the client. In the meta coaching system, we use several patterns to facilitate this. The releasing judgment pattern, the decontamination pattern. So that's why part of what we do in ACMC, we learn to get into the state of no nothing. So that we listening, non-instrumental listening. So that's the first uh, challenge for the coach. The second uh, thing, Secondly, the challenge of supporting the client. Support begins with listening and goes beyond that to offering one's presence apart from trying to do anything. It is trying to do something, even if it is helpful and which comes from a good spirit that often feels surprisingly unsupportive to the client. Sometimes, Clients will even speak up and say, I just want you to listen to me. <laughs> I don't want to consider doing anything right now. I just want to say what I've got to say. Even more challenging about support is being able to say or express the client's point or perspective. Coaches in training are sometimes especially resistant to this. And Michael mentioned uh, this example because uh, when he tested them, why are you resistant to say what the client uh, 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 said? And this happens especially when what the client has said is evaluated as the, uh, by the coach as negative. And they do not want to repeat that because it feels like they are, they are reinforcing the negativity. Yet another surprise, it almost always has the opposite effect. That's because the coach, when the coach feeds it back, 
The client gets to hear it. And sometimes for the first time in their life, sometimes it helps the client feel heard, understood, and validated. When you support the client by repeating to the client what they say, they feel heard, and now they are finally ready to move on. The third one is uh, the challenge of receiving and giving feedback to the client. For many, this is very uncomfortable, being like a clean mirror and just receiving whatever the client puts out and mirroring it back, unfiltered, uncontaminated by our own thoughts and evaluations. Sometimes this feels very personal and intimate. At times it can feel embarrassing, as if you are crossing a line. Yet, just as often as it can be the turning point in a person's life. This is especially true if it brings up a blind spot for the person. Something that all of this, uh, of all of his um, close friends and colleagues have never addressed because they didn't want to hurt his feelings or didn't know how to bring it up. Yeah. So that's the third one. And the fourth one is the challenge of asking questions, especially really personal questions. Yeah. Michael, uh, in, the, uh, in, in the book, uh, The Meta Coaching System, he related a story about a coach in France who told him that where he grew up in northern France, it was just not polite to ask questions. And it was especially not okay to ask questions that might put someone on the spot or embarrass him. And I think that's quite similar to uh, our uh, notion of politeness, to not ask questions that cause people to feel uh, uh, to feel embarrassed, uh, the questions that have not been asked. But that is in the social context. In the coaching context, we need to ask those questions because those are the questions uh, that, uh, that will create the breakthrough for the, uh, for the client. The coaching conversation is a challenging one to the coach as well as to the client until the coach integrates the attitude and skill of challenging. This is, to a great extent, much of the training and development that occurs in most coach training programs. In meta coaching, we describe this as the art of compassionate challenging. This comes from a master coach, uh, Graham Richardson uh, of Australia, and his challenge, and this is uh, the observation of his clients and also the observation of people observing him, him coaching, uh, we use the term ruthlessly compassionate. While being firm challenges some coaches, it is the other side, the compassion part, that challenges other coaches. Why? Because regarding the coaching process, you have to care. So that's why the state for supporting is caring. You have to care. You as the coach have to really have a big heart for people and care about their well-being. They, this is something that you cannot fake. Further, you have to communicate it so that they get it. They get it that you care. You are asking, you are challenging because you care. So you have to be real and personable and intimate enough with them so that they know that you have their best interest at heart. Your care also has to continue even when to do things that will test it. When they engage in off-putting behaviors such as making excuses, keep changing the subject, when they avoid answering your questions, play dumb, act arrogant, pout, talk like a victim, etc. So these are the times that you need to come in and from the state of caring 
fully caring for your client, challenge the client uh, with respect to those behaviors. So what's a coach to do to handle all of these challenges in the coaching conversations? First and foremost, get grounded and centered in yourself. As a coach, you have to know who you are and keep your person separated from your behaviors so that you can operate from a place of love, compassion, care, discipline, firmness, and challenge. And all of this is what any legitimate coach training program ought to include. So in the uh, this point on uh, coaching and extremely challenging conversation, uh, I mentioned four points, four main points why it is a challenging conversation. One is the challenge of really listening. Secondly, the challenge of supporting the client. Third, the challenge of receiving and giving feedback to the client. And the fourth one, the challenge of asking questions, especially really personal questions. So let me pause there and I'd like to invite uh, any questions or comments from any one of you. So go ahead. Yes, Lily, go ahead. Sorry, I have so much question. <laughs> uh, uh, can you elaborate on the part that you mentioned that the, the cherub, I mean, for the listening, secret listening means that you listen with no purpose. Uh, can you elaborate on this one? Because for me, it's like when you listen, surely you, you are listening with purpose and your purpose is to help the, the client on the Gucci, right? So mm -hmm. what, what do you mean by listen with no purpose? Yeah. So instrumental listening is when you listen with the purpose of to correct something, uh, to put things right. Uh, so some uh, sometimes uh, the, the, the therapist inside of you listen and thinking about, okay, so what? Uh, what intervention should I bring in in order to uh, in order to rectify this? So those are what we call instrumental listening. Now, the sacred listening is to just listen to understand the client from his or her uh, worldview. So to understand the map of the client, because their map is different from ours. In the next. Uh, uh, point where, when we go into the uh, presuppositions of NLP that uh, will uh, make it uh, clear. So uh, what we do is sacred listening is about understanding the client. It is not about uh, arguing or rebutting with the client or to fix the client or whatsoever. It is from the state of understanding. So when you are listening from the state of understanding, then the questions come naturally because you are questioning to understand and by elaborating that both you and the client gain clarity yeah i hope that makes sense to you yeah yes thank yes you. thank you very much thank you roy uh, is there something that you would like to say Yes, Marisuki, I, I, I want to ask uh, whether at a certain point, uh, uh, in, in my experience, when I was uh, trying to, when I was uh, coaching uh, some members of my team, uh, there will be occasions where in, uh, they don't want to speak at all. Or if uh, uh, they all of a sudden stop. Because uh, either they're waiting for my next question mm -hmm. or um, they're not just open enough to me. Uh, how, do you, how do you usually approach that scenario? Mm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the, 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 the first rule of coaching is the client is coachable. Yeah. Okay. So 
So if let's say the client during the, uh, through the conversation, they don't feel that they want to be coached further, then uh, uh, in my uh, experience is to stop coaching. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't benefit the client. However, the other thing that uh, uh, one of the presuppositions that we use in NLP uh, is that uh, resistance is a sign of lack of rapport. So if in the coaching conversation, then you notice resistance coming from the uh, client. Stop coaching and go back to building rapport. Because uh, in, in any, uh, you, you see, in any social interaction, rapport is a state that we move in and out with a person. Sometimes it goes in deep and sometimes it rises up to be a little bit shallower. So it could be that through that conversation uh, that the client uh, just, uh, there is a break in rapport. And that's why the client doesn't uh, feel safe, doesn't want to continue. So stop coaching and uh, go ahead and rebuild the rapport. And when the client is ready, then we can move back into coaching. Is that useful? Okay. Yeah. So Thank you. what I mean is that, that point, resistance is a sign of lack of rapport. Marzuki, may I yeah. ask a question to Roy? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. yeah ask go ahead. Roy a question. Roy, I'm just curious whether this context was a group coaching context or is it one to one? It's one to one. It's one to one. Mm. So, you know, when that happens to me, when they just stop or when they just um, uh, pull back, uh, what I do is I reflect back to them that I'm present to you uh, pulling back, I sense that there's certain resistance that has come up and I'm just curious what's going on with you. Uh, I might just inquire about that behavior. And, uh, you know, they might say, I'm, I'm uh, you know, uncomfortable. Uh, then you ask them specific questions about what they're uncomfortable with or about, but I just would go deeper into why they've uh, begun to pull back or shut down and, and say, say to them, feedback to them because you are the mirror to say to them that this is what I'm present to or I'm noticing. The flavor of our conversation has uh, chilled a bit and I'm just wondering about that. Thank you. Uh, th that's a, a good uh, way to approach it. Yeah. Yeah. So no notice what uh, Tessie has demonstrated just now is the skill of giving feedback. Giving feedback with, with respect to what's happening in the conversation. So thank you for that. Tessie. Similarly to Gua Ching's question, if the client suddenly gets frustrated, crying, should the coaching conversation stop? Absolutely not, because every time there's a burst of emotion is a brilliant gateway to discover more, to uncover more about what's going on with the client. So what do you say, Mazuki? I would just yeah. be reflecting back that that's what I'm noticing. What's that about? Uh, you know, I noticed that you are, you are demonstrating this the first thing I would ask is, so where do you feel this frustration in your body? You know, is, is there a message in this frustration if it's in your chest or in your shoulders or is it giving you a headache? Uh, does it have a, a texture to it? Does it have a color? Um, inquire like that, what, what you said just now, Marzuki, the know nothing questioning because yeah. you're, so, you're so curious about what that is about. And chances are, I mean, my, my experience is um, that's going to be a gateway to uncovering so much information about what that client needs. Yeah. Yeah. And this is uh, uh, also an area where the coach needs to be comfortable with emotions. Mm 
with uh, your own emotions and with people uh, uh, showing their emotions. So if we as a coach are not comfortable with the emotions, then when, when uh, the clients are uh, uh, exhibiting those emotions, then we get thrown out from the coaching state. So this is where as, uh, as a coach, uh, we need to be coachable in the sense that uh, we are comfortable in our own skin. And then uh, I don't understand Chantel's uh, question. Um, could, could you explain a bit Chantel? I would love to learn about this one. Um, yep. Yeah. Hi, everyone. So I, what have the client like we've gone through when, you know, we, we have a few sessions and um, this client's always self-victimizing. For example, she goes like, oh, I've already done this, but, you know, everybody else is at fault. For example, it's not, it's, it's the, she keeps self-victimizing herself. Um, and it's like, why, I'm, why did you apply the label self-victimizing? Is that her words or your words? Um, basically, she says that she's the victim. She says, I'm being bullied. Um, I'm the victim. And, but when I talk to HR, when I talk, you know, and we have a 360 surveys that come up, it's actually the opposite, you see. Mm. Yeah. And, and even her superior also says that um, that's, that's, that's not true. So it's her map of the world that she mm. thinks that she's being victimized. She mm. thinks that uh, people are bullying her, but I mean, I've gone through sessions, I've asked personal um, questions as well, and um, mm. I found that it's also due to something in her, her marriage, uh, that she, in the family, which is abusive, mm. um, that she came out from. So I was telling her, you know, no, don't let that uh, bring, uh, bring in to, to her work. But um, she, she keeps on, you know, being self-victimizing, says, you know, mm. I've done everything, it's, it's not my fault. And mm. she keeps saying that, but everybody else in the organization um, she says that bullies her, but it's not true. <laughs> yeah. So Mazuki, in in uh, neurosemantics, Michael has a brilliant pattern called uh, metastating troubling emotions. So this pattern would work very well with Chantel's client. Mm. So I'll leave you to it to explain. Yeah, uh, yeah. You can help the client to manage her emotions. Uh, however, uh, Chantel, when you asked that question and you mentioned that the clients say I am a victim and uh, being bullied, mm. uh, I'm reminded by uh, Michael's email today uh, <laughs> in the MetaCoach uh, e-group. Uh, the title of the email is, we need some elaboration here. So when the client says, I'm a victim, mm. and that's when you meta model that language. So you say that you're a victim. What specifically did you experience? What is it that uh, someone or uh, uh, people do in the workplace that makes you say that you are a victim? What is the behavior? So yeah. victim is a, a nominalization, is a category. Uh, bullying. Yeah. I'm being bullied. So what is it that uh, you experience? What did people do that made you say that you are being bullied? So uh, those are uh, by by elaborating, getting them to elaborate, then that helps you to uh, understand their model of the world. Yeah, um, just to, because I did ask that and she came up with all the reasons. Um, mm. An example, one of it is that, oh, my colleague talks to me in um, English, but she talks to others in Mandarin. So to her is that that is um, you know you you are um, um, treating me differently. Yeah, you are bullying me. Um, a little bit things, example like um, you know um, in a in a WhatsApp group because they see she's busy, so they basically don't put her inside the WhatsApp group. When I go through in detail, then um, she said because. At the first point, they don't put her in a WhatsApp group. She feels like she's an outcast and she's being bullied. Wow, that's a lot of piling up there. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. And, yeah. and look, it's different people. And then another person, she says that, oh, um, because that she don't, you don't answer my emails immediately, uh, you're mm -hmm. bullying me. Like, so, oh. <laughs> so you know, you know this pattern. I'm just going to do it for, for two seconds, Mazuki, if you don't mind. So, you know, th there's a troubling emotion behind all of her behavior, right? 
Mm -hmm. So, you know, like Mazuki says, start with the meta model, uh, get sensory specific about how she makes that mean that she's being bullied. Mm -hmm. So let's just say that's true, that you've been bullied. So what do you believe about that? Mm -hmm. Oh, I believe that I've been unfairly treated. So what makes you think that way? What do you make it mean about yourself? And then it'll go up the hierarchy. You know the hierarchy, right? Mm -hmm. You've done that, Chant Chantel? And then yep. it'll come to something um, like a threshold that says, uh, I think I'm a nobody or nobody wants to be with me or, you know. Yep. And then you do like uh, the meta no pattern. Like, do you want to stay this way? And how long do you want to stay this way for? Are you ready for a change, yep. right? Actually, I tried that and she said, yes. The next coaching session, she reverts back again. <laughs> you, need to, you need to go deeper in the emotion yeah yeah okay. and uh, what i am also hearing is uh when we look at the power zone mm -hmm. uh she is not fully in her power zone absolutely uh, the powers of thinking feeling saying and doing mm -hmm. she's attempting to control other people's powers of saying and doing uh, yeah, yeah and then equating that with uh, uh, uh as the cause for her feeling whereas her feelings are her uh, powers so yeah. that is also an area that she also needs to look at yeah. uh, a very important uh, uh, condition in coaching is that the person needs to be fully response able so that's why uh, in uh, a uh, apg the first pattern is the ownership of the power zone <laughs> Mm. So obviously, this girl is blaming a lot, so she's yeah. not yep. in her power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yes. Yeah. So she's blaming other people's behavior for yeah. her mental, uh, for her emotional state. Ah, uh, yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 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 Thank I... you for that, uh, Chantal. <laughs> I hope that helps. <laughs> Twenty-seven yeah. minutes and yeah, Inch Mazuki. Yeah. Yes, Chief. Yeah. Yeah, again, come to this victim thingy, right? Mm. Because sometimes, I mean, to me, it's like, I mean, why, why can't, I mean, the person just change that mindset kind of, like, even though, like, the boss want to bully him or frozen him kind of things, right? Mm. Why don't he can change the mindset? I mean, then I got nothing to do and yet, I'm still getting my salary and could live a good life. Why not kind of thing? Is it this kind of thinking can be uh, accepted or whatsoever kind of things? Uh, again, check see, I didn't quite get that. Okay, for example, right, a person have been, I mean, so-called keep a side sideline side line by the boss, what the layman call frozen kind of things, mm -hmm. put in the fridge and try to uh, so-called force him to resign whatsoever to leave the, the, the company so that the company no, no need to compensate him kind of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the person can be like blaming the, the boss whatsoever while you bullied me, you sideline me, you try to make me resign and leave the company without compensate me, all this kind of thing. Can the person like change the mind that instead of like being victimized, why don't you just thank the boss? Why, why you make my life so comfortable where I no need to work and yet I enjoy the salary and enjoy the good life here, working here, do nothing kind of thing. Can we, can this is acceptable or whether it's, it's a wrong thing to, to do? Um, yeah, uh, if I understand that uh, well, is that so... The behaviors from the uh, uh, from the em uh, employer or the boss is uh, in a certain way. Uh, yeah. the, the thing is that your states are derived from your thinking and your feeling. So mm -hmm. yes, as you said, he can uh, through his thinking say that oh I'm being victimized by the boss and all Correct. that because of yeah. that I'm going to leave, yes. or. He can also go, go into other ways of thinking. So this is where we talk about ownership of your own states. Yeah. So uh, your states are the results of your uh, thinking feeling. You are the one who are uh, responsible for that. So if you yeah. are not happy with that state, you can change it by, as Tessie, men Tessie mentioned just now, say yeah. no to the old frames of your thinking yeah. And finding new ways. So if that person in, in your example says, uh, goes into finding new ways of thinking about the job, okay, yeah. the boss wants me to chill out uh, uh, and not be 
uh, too harassed by work. Okay, I'm going to just enjoy what I'm doing. Uh, yeah. I still get my salary. Correct. Right. <laughs> <Gaji> buta. <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> what works? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Right. Thank you. <laughs> so let's uh, put on uh, our next point over here, uh, and okay. Uh, this next point is on the kinds of coaching conversation, the kinds of coaching conversation. I will not be uh, going uh, into detail over here. I will just uh, mention that because uh, uh, I would say in the earlier uh, program, uh, earlier session, we've discussed that many different kinds of coaching conversation. Uh, and also I've all, I've already gone into uh, uh, about 20 of those conversations uh, in detail. What I would like to bring out to you is uh, probably as a reminder to you that there are basically three different types, not different types, three different categories of uh, co uh, coaching conversations. So let's take a look at the first one. This first one is in the category of the basic coaching conversations. What are they? One is the clarity conversation. Next is the decision uh, conversation. The third one is planning conversation. Fourth is the experience or resource conversation. The fifth one is the change conversation. And the sixth one is the uh, confrontation conversation. So these six uh, kinds of coaching conversations are what Michael uh, termed as the basic coaching conversation. So when we are having conversation with client one-on-one, -on -one, typically we are having uh, either one of these conversations with a client, okay? Now, the next category is the category of the group and team conversation. So with the group and team in having conversations, what you are going into is one is the mediation conversation. So I'm mediating between the uh, group. Next is the meta conversation. Meta moving into the structure of the conversation itself within the group then the rounds conversation in order to uh, pick out the, uh, the thinking processes or the feeling of the each uh, and every of the group member. Then the problem solving conversation. Number 11 here is the collective learning conversation. One is the learning from each person and then the learning from the group or team. And uh, another conversation is the conflict resolution conversation. Of course, when you have groups or team of people together, there are bound to be disagreements and that may lead to conflict. So this is another conversation that you uh, want to hold with a group or team. So these are uh, in the category of group and team coaching conversations. Uh, the third category here is the category of executive coaching conversations. One is the sounding board conversation or the clarity conversation. So you are just bouncing of ideas in order to get clarity. Next is the outcome conversation for clarity conversation. So it is also a, 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 a kind of clarity conversation. However, this is focused on identifying the outcome because in, in the executive uh, situation, uh, the executive is making decisions. So they need to identify the outcome. The other is the feedback uh, conversation. This happens when you are doing shadow coaching. Uh, the executive, wanting to uh, perform at a higher level, uh, uh, wanting to eliminate any blind sides, engage you as the shadow coach to shadow the executive in order for you to be able to give feedback to the executive about uh, his or her behaviors. 
Next one is the systems conversation, looking at how uh, behaviors are organized in the organization and how they impact other areas of the organization. Then the paradox conversation, things that may appear to be at odds with one another. Uh, those are uh, the uh, paradox uh, occurring. Then the potential conversation, looking into the not just the executive's potential, but also it could be with the organizational potential. Number 19 is the integrity or ethical con uh, conversation. It's about the executive operating from his uh, or her uh, own values, uh, whether the behaviors are congruent with their values. Uh, and uh, this is what we refer to as the ethics of that particular executive. And number 20 is the political conversation. In an organization where people come in together, there are certain rules about playing uh, games. So the political uh, conversation comes in in that particular situation. So the, these are the three different kinds, uh, sorry, three, three different categories of coaching conversations. Uh, and from these three different categories, uh, we identify 20 different kinds of coaching conversations. So if you are, uh, if you want to know more about those, uh, uh, I would highly recommend you reading the book from Michael Hall, Coaching Conversations. It covers uh, something like 24 different kinds of conversations uh, in that particular book. Okay. So let me just pause here before we go to the next point. Any uh, additions that anyone like to make? Any comments or questions? Both uh, item one and two on the uh, on the executive coaching one appear the same. They're both clarity conversations. Yes, both are for clarity. Uh, one is just bouncing off uh, ideas. The other is uh, zooming into the outcome. Uh, both give clarity. Okay. Right, so let's move to the next point, which is the NLP communication model for the coaching conversations. So this will be the final point for, uh, for this evening. Now, if neuro-linguistic programming is anything, it is most essentially a communication model. So that's why we repeat it over and over again to say that NLP is a communication model. There are many reasons for this. First, NLP was created by modeling the communication expertise in three world-class communicators, Fritz Pauls, Virginia Satir, and Milton Erickson. Second, the first model of NLP was the meta model of language in therapy, which detailed 11 linguistic distinctions with suggested questions for challenging each distinction. Third, this model was created by using the distinctions of transformational grammar. And fourth, most of the premises or presuppositions of NLP are communication principles. So that's why we say that uh, NLP is a communication model. Now, among the central communication principles in NLP are these, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. So let's take a look at the uh, presuppositions that relates to communication in NLP. This first one I've put here is that the meaning of your communication is the response you get, regardless of your intention. <laughs> your intention may be one thing, however, you may get the response in another because that's what that's how the other person has understood it. So that's why we say the meaning of your communication is the response you get, regardless of your intention. The next presupposition is 
The map is not the territory. It is just a mental map that you have about something out there. You created that map. How accurate that map is will determine how healthy we live with the territory. If our map is so far detached from the territory, then we have a lot of interfacing problems and uh, it will not be healthy for us. So uh, that's why we say the map is not the territory, it's just a mental map. So if there are uh, any issues that I have with respect to interacting with the world out there, that's why we go into the frames. It's the frames that are causing the problems out there. So that's the second one. The third one is people operate in the world and in relation to each other from their mental maps. So how we relate to others is not really because of others, but because of the mental expectation or understanding that we have about others. So if I were to have the, uh, the, the notion that, uh, that uh, Tessie is a kind and loving person, then I will behave in that way uh, towards her. However, if I have this notion that uh, Tessie is a psychopathic killer, then I will run away from her. <laughs> it has nothing to do with Tessie. Those are all my maps of her. So that's why we say that uh, people operate in the world and in relation to each other from their mental map. So that's why uh, meta coaching is about getting those maps to be healthy and resourceful for us. Next one over here is that uh, rapport with people begins when you match their verbal and non-verbal expressions. So we talked a little bit uh, about rapport. And uh, again, uh, I, I'm currently watching that uh, documentary right now. Uh, babies, they are excellent uh, uh, pattern detectors. And when they detect pattern, they are feeding back to their parents or to the adults around them according how they are uh, detecting detecting in. So that's why uh, uh, babies, uh, it is very easy for, for you to get into rapport. Just uh, uh, two days ago, I was just uh, uh, walking to the, uh, to the shop and the cars are parked very uh, 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 in front of the shop and I was walking in between the cars and the, the, there was this, uh, and this baby in her uh, uh, daddy's arm. The daddy was sitting in the car uh, with the window down, uh, holding the baby. And the baby was uh, uh, was uh, probably uncomfortable, making sounds uh, like squealing and all that. However, the moment I uh, uh, I walked past, she noticed me. Her eyes straight went to mine and locked. Uh, our eyes locked. That's almost automatic to get the eyes to lock in order to uh, build that rapport. So uh, this, is, uh, this is why we say that a rapport with people begins when you match their verbal and non-verbal uh, expression. So in uh, Coaching Essentials, we cover uh, all the steps to getting into rapport. Next one is people engage in both self-communication and communication with others using the representational systems. What are they? Visual, auditory, kinesthetic, olfactory, and gastetory. And language and the meta representational system. So when we communicate with ourselves, we are using those systems. And we are, when we communicate with others, we are also using those same systems. So going back to the previous um, uh, point on rapport, knowing that people communicate using those uh, uh, representational systems, using the systems that other people use help us to build better rapport with others. So that's also why as a coach, we want to be sensitive to listening to those. And the last uh, one that uh, I would like to share with you this evening is on resistance 
is usually caused by the lack of rapport. And I'm grateful that uh, Roy, uh, you mentioned about the situation where suddenly uh, the, uh, the the client uh, backs off and all that. Uh, the moment uh, you experience that, you uh, the uh, the uh, what do you call it? the the decision or the the uh, the feedback that you want to get from there is that oops, there is already a break in rapport. So what is it that I need to do? in order to get back into rapport. And as what uh, uh, the example uh, that uh, Tessie mentioned is an excellent way of getting back into rapport by, by feeding back to the client about the, uh, the process of the conversation uh, in order to get back into rapport. Yeah? So the NLP communication model uh, for the coaching con uh, conversations are critical. When we bring the meaning of your communication is the response you get regardless of your intention the map is not the territory it is just a mental map that you have about something out there people operate in the world and in relation to each other from their mental maps rapport with people begins when you match their verbal and non-verbal expressions uh, people communicate in both self-communication and communication with others using the rep systems and language, the meta representational system. And the uh, last one I mentioned is regarding resistance is usually caused by the lack of rapport. So those are the four main points that uh, I uh, um, I'm sharing with you this evening. Uh, so I hope that uh, that has helped you uh, with this topic uh, that we are discussing on the uh, conversation. So uh, I'd like to open up uh, the session to each and every one of you. Uh, first, uh, first of all, are there any questions with respect to that last point just now? Go ahead. Uh, Marsuki, Roy, uh, about the mental maps, um, how do you usually uh, change or I would call it mindset? Because sometimes we, we have this uh, thing in our mind, I, I, I suppose, and that's why the mental maps is based on our experiences and on, on the, on the way we think uh, that is controlled by the mind. Uh, what is your usual way of... Uh, or preventing yourself from being trapped in that mental map such that you are able to have great conversation. Uh, are there practices that you can recommend so that a coachy or a coach rather doesn't get uh, entangled in their mental maps? Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, Roy. Um, what I would say is that one is the uh, presuppositions uh, of NLP. There are 18 or sometimes in certain books, there are nine, uh, 21 presuppositions. Those are mindsets that help uh, me. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, this is something that grew on me. You know, when, I, when I first learned uh, NLP, you know which part that I hate the most? Which the better model of language with all of those questions so much detail uh! <laughs> and i say that it grew on me because that is the core of the nlp communication model and from that model we know about the uh, distortions the cognitive distortions and the more that i begin to study the cognitive distortions and apply to self then that is where I begin to catch myself whether uh, I am responding to people in resourceful ways or not. So yes, uh, the uh, 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 from the meta model of language, the uh, cognitive distortions, how we handle those uh, cognitive distortions, uh, using it on self, it helps me to be to be able to respond to be uh, to people. Healthily, you know, a simple thing like generalization. Ah, these kind of people they always behave like that. And I hear myself asking, "Always? 
<laughs> and then I go, no, 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 not always. That person is behaving in that way right now. You are making a generalization. <laughs> so having those conversations in mind, uh, to me, it helps uh, greatly, tremendously. <laughs> Thank you. Is that useful, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, because I don't want to be trapped in that uh, scenario. I think sometimes uh, uh, I call it autopilot, right? Sometimes we mm. we just respond to things based on our experiences, and if we are not so aware of it, uh, we might just be working on our coaching uh, sessions on a mental map. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now coming on to uh, uh, slightly over quarter past nine, I would like to come to the, uh, to me, the, the favorite part of the session, uh, the takeaway, what are your takeaways for uh, this session? So I would like to take this opportunity to invite each and every one of you uh, to share with us one or two of your takeaway for uh, this evening. So if you don't mind, let me start off with the bottom of my screen. That's my... Uh, that's my, my favorite place to start, at the bottom of my screen. So, um, uh, Diana uh, or Diana, uh, uh, are you able to access your mic uh, and allow us to know what is your can takeaway? Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. All right. I guess for me, it's the last one, um, you know, piggybacking on Ryan's question and um, how you answered it. A lot of us, you know, mainly we're, we're kind of trying to be cautious as much as we can and self-awareness is not so easy to learn. Um, you know, walking the talk is hard enough. Um, walking the walk is even harder. So thank you. Thank you for that. I guess for me, that's the biggest one that I uh, I took away from, from tonight. Thank you, Diana. Uh, and uh, moving, to, moving on to Chantal. Go ahead, Chantal. Yeah, um, I think the part that definitely the advice given for my client, which is the self-victimizing client, that was really very helpful. When I find that it's just true, she doesn't have um, she doesn't she's not in the power, but she is actually putting trying to take others' power. I think that's actually very um insightful as as well. I think that the part of when you mentioning that we support and we come into a clean um slate as well is a good kind of remembrance for me to come in with that as well. Um, so I think that's really um, the two huge insights that I got today. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Chantal. Appreciate that. Uh, and uh, Elizabeth, are you able to uh, speak uh, with us? I, I just have a quick one. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mazuki, for, for the very valuable... Uh, it, you know, I, I'm a newbie. So I, I, I learned something like, you know, listening can be no purpose or so that it can reach somewhere. We usually listen with the purpose and try to derive something. So, you know, we, we listening with no purpose also can derive something that's very valuable. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Elizabeth. Thank you. Uh, next uh, is uh, Lily. Go ahead, Lily. Thank you, Mazuki. Uh, for me, my, my key takeaway is a reminder about myself. To, to be, you know, like as a coach, think in terms of the listening skill. And as well as uh, just now Chantal was sharing the self victim my uh, scenario whereby I do face the same challenge of, of one of my mentee. In fact, it's a mentee. And I think this is a good lesson for me to remind myself that yeah, he she also complained a lot. Everybody like everyone is not right, and then uh, she's the victimized and all this. And I did put a little bit emotion. That means that I, I really empathy about her because she is also a, a cancer patient. Yeah. So at that time, I kind of like not sure what I can do, but I try to gain uh, her trust, which is okay for me, but I think at this point of time, I still have not really helped her to come up from that kind of thinking yet. Yeah, so I think that what, what I can, I, I learned just now from the, the story that uh, Chantel was sharing, I think it's, it's a very good 
uh, points for me to, to think about and trying to help the, the person. Wow. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lily. Appreciate that. Uh, moving to Guaqing. Go ahead, Guaqing. It's a wow session. And thank you to Mazuke and also everyone for the great insights. And the key takeaway from uh, for, from my side is uh, bring in caring, uh, compassion, and also curious when the client is getting into uh, emotion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Thank you, Guaqing. Appreciate that. Uh, next, uh, Tessie, you're next. Thanks, Mazuki, for today and uh, for inviting me always. Um, I love meeting new people. I've been coaching for so long, and uh, I can say without a doubt, coaching is the most difficult, challenging, uh, emotional process, uh, you know, compared to other work that I've ever done. So I'm always looking for new ways to uh, re-energize and to continue my learning process. So thank you very much for today. Thank you, uh, Tessie. Appreciate that coming from you. Uh, next, uh, Chexiu. Uh, go ahead, Chexiu. Okay, hi. Uh, thank, thank you for the session. I I think I already did one thing uh, today because like you I say you get a new frame kind of thing, break the old frame and uh, get a new frame for myself. Yeah, today I get a new frame for myself. Because last time, every Thursday caught me into a dilemma. I want to go to work, and yet nah, your session is at 8 o'clock kind of thing. So I need to rush myself, make sure I push myself, uh, finish 5km walk before like 7.50, then go, go to a cafe, get a seat, and then sit there and you know order a pizza and a giant glass of uh, ice lemon tea and listen, sit there for one and a half hours. So today is, uh, I don't know whether you can see or not, I walk almost 15 kilometers. Wow. For the yeah, so by the end of the session, I will walk 15 kilometers. So actually, it's um actually make me more healthier. Like, I'm healthier because why? Because first I'm I'm not eating the pizza and the ice, uh, the giant glass of ice lemon tea, and yet I can walk extra 10 km. So it's to, today total I walk 15 km. So thank you for the session to make me healthier, physically yeah. and mentally. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Chuck Su. Appreciate that. Uh, go, Chuck Su. And uh, Roy, last but not least, uh, Roy, let me hear from you. Well, first, first of all, uh, Rizuki, thank you for the invite. Uh, I really appreciate it. I enjoy it a lot. It's a, a very uh, productive uh, uh, session today. My takeaway, uh, for one, is the rapport. You mentioned about if there's resistance, uh, look at rapport, uh, which is uh, something that I, I also want to uh, test and, uh, uh, and the way that I uh, deal with my coaches. Um, you mentioned about care, which I think uh, rapport is connected to it. Without, without uh, uh, true care for the coachee, the rapport may not be uh, simulated or connected. And uh, um, Tessie mentioned about energizing because I, 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 I tried the uh, Many times that after coaching, I feel drained, even though I know that the person was able to come up with something that would make them improve. Mm -hmm. I I would always feel the the drain in me, mm -hmm. and so when Tessie said re-energizing, I think uh, that's also another takeaway that coaches uh, really have to re-energize themselves. Okay, thank you. Wow. Thank you for sharing that, Roy. Appreciate uh, listening from you. So uh, before we end, uh, just let me share uh, the screen uh, for the last time. So uh, in the book, The Meta Coaching System, uh, Michael mentioned these points uh, uh, to, to remind us what we have covered in the session. Now, the first one is that uh, facilitating a deep personal and intense conversation is the heart and soul of coaching. So this is what uh, we want to look at. And so, uh, Roy, when you mentioned that your, your energy uh, is uh, fully dr uh, is drained when, after a coaching session because you are there fully uh, heart and soul. So this is also uh, why uh, you feel that way. So that's why uh, a coach needs to learn how to rejuvenate himself uh, very quickly. <laughs> uh, the next one is that coaching is a 
not so normal conversation. And uh, as um, uh, most of you have already uh, experienced, it requires a lot of energy, it requires a lot of effort because you, you, you don't just speak your mind uh, in coaching because when you go into coaching, you know nothing. You are speaking from the mind of the client. So that's why it is a uh, uh, not so normal conversation. Uh, and the third one here is that there are a great many different kinds of coaching conversations. So uh, from three categories, uh, Michael in the book mentioned about uh, 20 uh, different kinds of conversation. So as a coach, we want to be able to uh, know at least the first six because that one, those are the basic uh, conversations. And then depending on the different categories of conversations that you have to build up skills in the others. So uh, before we end, a uh, couple of uh, announcements that I would like to make. Uh, one is that uh, I'm uh, on, on, on a cyclical basis, I'm running this program, the Leadership Foundation program. This is part of the uh, Neurosemantics Leadership uh, Diploma. The first element is uh, coaching essentials. Uh, I, I will be starting this uh, uh, this program in uh, on Saturday. Uh, uh, those of you who are familiar with Coaching Essentials APG, you may notice that hey, Mazuki is doing it in four days. Yes, I'm uh, I'm now doing it four days instead of three, uh, in order in order that the, uh, that when you come in and learn it, uh, I I don't need to skip things. I've, I've got everything in there for you. So that's why I've decided to do it in four days nowadays. Uh, next uh, uh, APG. Uh, uh, that will be in uh, October. And then uh, Unleashing Leadership, uh, I've just uh, completed one uh, yesterday. So this one will be in November, December. So, the, so those uh, three form the uh, Leadership Foundation Program from Neurosemantics. And these are all uh, in-person programs uh, because they are part of the certification training. So you need to be here. Uh, so, Roy, if you want to join in, then you'll have to fly. Otherwise, uh, uh, there'll be uh, uh, many trainers there in uh, Manila uh, who will be able to help you with this. And the other uh, announcement that I would like to make is that ACMC um, 2023, this is the uh, this will be sponsored by the, Neuro, uh, the Institute of Neurosemantics, Malaysia, Philippines, and Singapore. Uh, it will be on the 16th to 24th of June, 2023. Uh, so I'd like to uh, invite those of you who have not uh, uh, been to this training, uh, come in uh, uh, to learn this. And those of you who are already meta coaches, uh, let's go in and re uh, review the program. So those are the uh, announcements uh, that I would like to make. And uh, we are here at the end of the session. I would like to say that it has been a great honor and a pleasure for me uh, to be uh, serving you in this way. And I hope that you, you have gained uh, something valuable for yourself. And I look forward to seeing you again the next time. So with that, stay safe and may God bless all of you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mazuki. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mazuki. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night.